All right, my dudes, welcome back. We are going to be taking a look at how to do our ball and tail animation today. Sorry that it's taken so long to get this tutorial to you guys, but I wanted to re-record it so that I could actually cover the content that was adjusted for our lessons this week, rather than giving a lot of superfluous inflammation, uh, inflammation, information that uh, wasn't needed. All right, so we're gonna be working with the file that I've already provided for you guys. This is our ball and tail animation file. And what we're going to be doing is, just as we did in class, we're going to make our character here uh, bounce across this gap that we have created for him. And we'll make sure to incorporate all of our secondary elements, such as our overlapping action and follow through, which we'll bring in on the tail, as well as the squash and stretch, which we'll adjust on the body, and obviously our timing in the actual jumps itself. All right. Now, I'm not going to go through sort of detail breaking down how this file was set up. We're going to work with bringing in assets from Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop later in the year. So for now, we're just going to focus what with, um, excuse me, with what we have here on screen. Now, in our composition, sorry, in here in our timeline, we have got three layers. So we've got our controller layer, which is a null object. Null objects don't really exist. They're kind of just controllers that we create inside of After Effects. And this controller is essentially going to be driving our character across the screen. We then have our tail outlines. So that's our tail layer over there. I'm going to lock that so I don't accidentally mess with it. And then my ball layer. Now you'll see that in the file that I provided for you guys, I forgot to put the ball layer's anchor point in the correct position. So with our ball layer selected, I'm going to grab the pan behind tool and I'm just going to shift the anchor point to the bottom center of our ball. That way when we play with our scale, our character will at least be moving and scaling correctly rather than from its center of mass. All right. Cool. Once that little adjustment has been made, let me just close these panels over here, seeing as we don't need them, and I can make some space. And we're pretty much ready to begin animating. Now, we're only going to be animating layer two and three, which is our tail and ball layer, to adjust their individual properties, which means to adjust the scale for the ball, we'll adjust some rotation on the tail layer, and there's an effect on this layer that I'll introduce when we get to that step. We're going to be doing all of our movement control here on layer one for our controller. Okay, so in order to make this work, what we're going to do is select layer one. And at the very beginning of our timeline, I'm just going to hit P for position. And I'm going to click on the little stopwatch icon over here, which turns on my position value and creates my very first keyframe. Now, I'd like to start with my character quite close to the edge of this ledge. So I'm going to just shift him up over here align him roughly there and essentially he's going to be starting off by looking at this gap i'm going to move out to the one second mark on my timeline and i'm simply going to click and drag my character backwards let's say roughly to that point over there so that over the course of my first two keyframes my character kind of pulls back we're going to use this as an opportunity to have him build and draw in his energy. So he's going to stretch in this particular situation. His tail is going to react to that buildup of energy. And then he's going to fly across the screen. All right. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift a couple of frames to the right. It doesn't matter how many. I'd say maybe 10 frames. And I'm going to copy and paste this keyframe. Now, the reason why I'm copying and pasting that keyframe is I'm essentially telling After Effects that I'm going to have this movement. It's going to hold for those 10 frames. So it's not going to do anything for those 10 frames. And then a little bit further down the timeline, my ball is going to jump into the air. All right, so my fourth keyframe, somewhere near the two second mark, my ball is now at the apex of its jump. And I'm just going to move out to the three second mark roughly and have my ball hit the ground. Now I'm not following along specifically on top of these seconds and that is because our animation here for this uh, ball bounce and ball tail animation rather is a little bit more complex than the ball bounce animation was. So it's not as easy to break down into um, just following these second marks per keyframe. So I'm kind of just going to be creating the spaces between the keyframes. Uh, you can follow along with those gaps. They don't need to be exactly the same as mine as long as at the end of the day, the motion looks similar. All right, what I'm gonna do is, now that I've had my character jump across that gap, I'm gonna quickly go up to my pen tool. And I'm gonna click and hold and grab my convert vertex tool. 
it's always a good process to just remove any of that bezier roundness that we currently have in these parts and that's going to make sure that I don't accidentally have my ball sliding off of the floor when it bounces. I'm going to hit V for my selection tool and I'm going to shift slightly down the timeline again. My ball is going to have a second little skip and then he's going to come to the ground. And you'll notice that I am decreasing the space between my keyframes as I plan this out. And that is so that that little hop at the end doesn't take as long to occur as my full jump does. All right. So I've got a couple of position keyframes. The first one sets me up at the beginning of my gap. My character then slides backwards to the left. This second keyframe has been copied and pasted 10 frames later. And then let's count this out. We can actually try and plot these. So 10, 20 will make that 20 frames. My ball jumps up into midair. 20 frames worked out perfectly. My character then lands on the ground. And then we can make these next ones 12 frames. So that's already 12 frames there. And then this one can be eight frames, which it already is. So that's actually kind of worked out well. All right, playing that back, we now have the most basic movement for our character. Looking good so far. Boring, but good. All right, I can see here at the end that my character doesn't touch the ground. So I'm just going to zoom in and make sure that he actually makes contact. And remember that we can always, if we go up to view, we can bring in our rulers. And if you go and turn on guides, I believe there's actually a little ruler guide in here that I forgot to remove. So I can always place that guide wherever I want it. I can go up to view and lock that guide and I can use it as necessary. A little bit late now, but that's fine. There's a little trick at the end that I can show you with our layers here that will help to make sure that our ball is touching the floor at the end. So I'm just gonna go up to view and I'm gonna turn off show guides just so that I don't have that little line there distracting me. All right, now we've done our position. Our ball is bouncing across the gap with a little hop at the end. And I'm now going to apply easing to this. Now, it's important that I apply easing now rather than later because the easing determines the force that is acting on my creature. And that will then determine how much I scale and rotate it later. So this is kind of an important next step. Once easing has been applied, what I'm going to do is quickly grab my Convert Vertex tool again. And only for these two keyframes that are in midair, I am going to click and drag and that will introduce a path to it. And if I just quickly reset this path and go back and drag out, you'll see that for my example here, I've got a little handle that's been generated so I can adjust that as well. If you don't have this little handle, don't stress. I think it just means that I didn't click on that key earlier. All right, but I've now got the rounded path in midair and a sharp path where it hits the ground and we're ready to dive into the graph editor. So if I play this animation back now, we take a look, it's looking okay. We can obviously tell where we need to adjust the timing. So with one of these keyframes selected, we're gonna go into the graph editor. And remember we are working in the speed graph. That's what this one looks like with the little speed bumps. If you open up your graph editor and it looks something like this, you're just looking at the wrong view for it. You can right click anywhere in this gray space in the graph editor and just make sure that edit speed graph is selected. All right, now, determining the speed of our movements. How I want this character to move to begin with is I'd like him to move back quite quickly and then ease into this slide. So what that's gonna to translate to is with my first keyframe selected or my second keyframe selected, I'm gonna grab the right handle over here and just shift it all the way towards the first keyframe. All right, so that's this little handle over here. Now I'm not gonna make a super sharp peak. I'm not gonna treat this as though it's our ball bouncing off the ground. Reason being, I do want to leave a little bit of time for my character to overcome inertia, speed up into that movement, and then slow down into that movement. All right, so that's looking pretty good. He then holds, and we can move to where our ball leaves the ground. Now, I'm going to align myself with my fourth keyframe. That's where my ball is in midair, because it makes a little bit more sense to me to work here in the graph. And I'm going to push these handles for this key to the extremes on either side. So this is exactly as it did in the ball bounce animation. We want an extreme peak at the beginning. That's where the ball leaves the ground. That's where our character has jumped off of the ground. It then slows down as it comes to the top of its apex. 
and it speeds up as it hits the ground. So here where we make contact, we'll make another peak. And then here for this last little jump at the end, what we can do is we won't make it slam into the ground. If I push this into a massive peak over here, what happens is that the ball then slams itself down and that doesn't feel too comfortable. So I'm gonna leave it with just a small little adjustment to that curve just so that it speeds up a little bit without uh, getting too extreme. Okay, my next step at this point, it's looking good. However, it's getting stuck in midair for its bounces. We remember that we need to zoom in on the graph editor and wherever our ball is mid in midair, we need to raise those keyframes off of that zero horizon line both for its major jump and for where we have this small jump at the end. Just so we can tell After Effects that even though that is where our ball is moving at its slowest speed, it's not coming to a complete stop. I'm quite happy with that. Lacquer. So now that we have done our position and we have done our timing using the graph editor, we can now ascertain how the rest of our secondary elements or secondary actions need to look. What I wanna do is, before we continue, I wanna get rid of all of this dead space in my timeline. My animation's not gonna be in excess of four and a half seconds, so I'm just gonna to go to the five second mark. Always good to leave a little bit of time just in case. And I'm gonna do one of two things. I'm either gonna come here to the end of this little gray bar to this blue head and click and drag to shorten my workspace to the five second mark. Or alternatively, I'm gonna hit N on my keyboard, N for NATO, and that will set the end point for this workspace. What I need to do next is just right click on this work area gray bar here and select trim comp to work area. All right, so right clicking on this gray bar, trim comp to work area. What that does is it deletes all of that excess space on our timeline. Our timeline is now only filled with the five seconds that we have set. All right, and so now hitting spacebar to play back, I don't have a five second wait. Looking good. All right, next we are going to start adding some scaling. We're gonna add our squash and stretch. Now we are not going to be doing scaling on our controller layer. Reason being, that because our controller layer is parenting the uh, tail and ball, which is a concept that might have vaguely been discussed in class, but will be dis, um, sort of dived into in a lot more detail next term. What happens is if I adjust my controller's scale, it is going to adjust the scale of the body as well as the tail. And we don't necessarily want to create the illusion that our tail is getting longer and fatter every time that it scales. So rather than working with scale on controller, what I'm going to do is unlock layer three, which is my ball layer. And I'm gonna hit scale or S for scale here and start off at the beginning of my animation by creating a keyframe. Now in our previous example, I had you guys set toggle hold to all of your scale keys as we progressed. That was a step that I've learned to, well, through experience kind of picked up seeing that it helps to make things a little less uh, terrifying the first time that we introduce working with scaling and After Effects. It's not a step that needs to be taken. So in this example, I'm not going to apply toggle hold to my scale keyframes where I don't need to. I'm just going to animate with normal keyframes and then I can apply um, easing to that afterwards. Okay, so, what I'm going to do now is my very first scale keyframe has been set at the start of the timeline. My value reads 100, 100, a perfect circle. And we are then going to roll out to where our ball comes to a stop at the start of that slide there. All right, and here we are going to sort of suck the character in on itself. So I'm just gonna make that value 80, 120. Still maintaining the, the proportions of our volume. These two values still add up to 200 in our heads but this slide sells the idea of our character sucking in on himself as a result of that action. Then, in line with my third position keyframe, as we have this hold going on, I'm going to essentially just copy and paste this scale keyframe, Command or Control C, Command Control V, and I'm gonna invert these values, make that 120, 80, 
And this is going to give us some time for our ball to squash down on itself, getting ready for that jump into midair. So my first scale keyframe is 100, 100. Second uh, scale keyframe in line with my second position keyframe reads 80, 120. Third scale keyframe reads 120, 80. All right. Now, our ball is going to be a perfect circle when it gets to the apex of its height. So I'm going to align myself with my fourth position keyframe and I'm going to type in 100, 100 there. However, I do want to sell the idea of my character stretching upwards as it jumps. So I'm just going to go back and realign myself with my third position and scale frame. And I'm going to count three frames. Let's make it five frames to the right. One, two, three, four, five. And what I'm going to do there is I'll just copy and paste my third keyframe, which read 120, 80. And I'll invert those values to read 120, 80. Oh, so <laughs> same values there. Sorry, they're going to read 80, 120. And that is going to stretch my character up. Okay. So just to go back with what we've done so far, first scale keyframe, 100, 100, we have a perfect circle. Our second scale keyframe reads 80, 120. That's our character drawing itself back as we move backwards. And our third position and scale frame rather has our ball squashing itself down, getting ready for a jump. Five frames later, one, two, three, four, five. Remember that you can navigate up and down your timeline either by using page up and page down on a Windows machine or on a keyboard. Or if you're on a MacBook like myself, holding down command and using the left and right arrow keys will shift you up and down. So my fourth scale frame, five frames beyond my third frame will read 80, 120. And then my fifth scale frame in line with my fourth position frame reads 100, 100. Now I need to do the exact same thing. These two keyframes that we've now just made where we have a squash to stretch. We are going to essentially just copy these two frames and paste them back here, but then swap them around. So what I'll do is just hit Command C, Command V to paste those two frames. All right. And you'll see that I've now pasted my first frame is where my ball is nice and flat. So the frame that has it stretched out, I'm just going to count five frames to the left. One, two, three, four, five. And I'm just going to move that keyframe there. So that actually comes before the flattened frame. That way we guarantee that my ball squashes down before the jump, stretches as he jumps, comes back to a perfect circle, stretches due to the speed of him falling, and then squashes where we hit the ground. Now we may need to adjust the positions of these keyframes a little bit, depending on how we adjust in the graph editor, but we'll take a look at that in a moment. For these little bounces, I'm not going to be too stressed about stretching my character up. Rather, I'm just going to align myself with my second last position frame. That needs to be 100, 100. I'll align myself with my final position frame. And that can be something like 110, 90, just to have a little bit of a blip at the end. And then five frames later, one, two, three, four, five, we can bring that back to a value of 100, 100. All right. It's important that we never have our ball ha make its final landing as a perfect circle because then we kind of break the illusion or the rules that we've set up so far that it will distort as it moves. So we always have it a little bit of a blip at the end and then coming to rest. And this little blip is actually then considered part of our follow through and overlapping action, which is quite nice. OK, so if I play this back, it's looking OK so far. We've got the basics that we need. So to run through it one more time, first keyframe, 100, 100. Second keyframe, that reads 80, 120. Third keyframe reads 120, 80. Five frames later, we then read 80, 120. Perfect circle as we get to the top of our jump. 80, 120 as our ball begins to stretch on its way back down to the ground. In line with our fifth position keyframe, as the ball hits the ground, we squash down to 120, 80. As we near the top of that little jump, it comes back to a perfect circle, 100, 100. And then we have a little scale blip at the end where in line with our final position keyframe, our scale reads 110, 90. And then five frames later, it comes back to 100, 100. Okay, I'm going to apply easing to these. So I'll select them and either hit F9 on my keyboard or right click keyframe assistant, easy ease. And then we can dive into the graph editor. Okay. Now, we want 
obviously the motion that we uh, define here in our graph editor to match the motion of the position. The position change is what is driving this major force. So if I go back into the graph editor for position, you'll see that I have got a little peak here at the start so that our character speeds up and then slows down into that slide. We then have a massive force as our character jumps. Then I have our slowest movement as he sails over the uh, gap, a peak where he lands, and then a small little cliff face almost in our graph there just to ease out our landing. And we're going to try and replicate this as best we can for the scale in the graph editor. So to begin with, I'm just going to select my second keyframe over here. Uh, let me just make this a little bit larger for you guys. And I'm going to drag my handles to the left. The exact same graph that we had for the position. All right, so I'm not going to make it too sharp. That's looking good. It is scaling the same time that it is moving. And that's when you can tell that your scaling is off or if it's on point. If the scale changes at the same speed and rate of the movement, then your squash and stretch is looking good. All right, so that's our first movement. Our second movement, our ball squashes down, getting ready to jump. So I could have this play out in a couple of ways. I think what I wanted to do is I'm going to select my third scale keyframe and I'm going to push the left handles a little bit to the left. And that means that my ball is going to squash down quite quickly. I might even adjust this ever so slightly. Just so it looks like our character is crouching down quickly and easing into that position as well. All right. Where our ball leaves the ground, this is where um, our stretch occurs. So that's where our ball starts stretching before coming to a perfect circle. We want that change to occur very quickly. So aligned still with my third uh, keyframe here, if I just zoom in, I am going to essentially just mimic the shape that I just made for that squash down. So I'm going to have a majority of that movement take place at the start. And that's going to look something like this. And that just means that it's not going to look like a, a flattened pancake as it leaves the floor. It's going to stretch up. And then it's going to start coming back to a perfect circle. And these I can leave. I'm actually quite happy with how the timing for this transition back to a perfect circle is working out. So the, this sort of like loop over here that takes place as our character is progressing from the stretch to the perfect circle, from perfect circle to stretch, I'm going to leave those as they are. Coming on to the next loop, this is the loop essentially as my ball hits the ground. So I'm going to align myself with that keyframe there. And if we take a look at what's happening here, you can see that my ball is starting to flatten out before it hits the ground. All right, so we want to try and stop it from doing that. And that means that we have our graph looks something like this, which means that it stays in that stretch and most of its action occurs as it hits the ground right there. So that's looking pretty good. Okay. Dope. Now, where our ball has made contact, this is where we're going to sort of follow through with the... Um, technique that we've learned so far. So as our ball makes contact, we're going to have a peak over here. And that's because I wanted to pop from being a flattened ball up to a perfect circle quite quickly. So most of my scale change is occurring over these three frames around this key here. Boom, perfect circle. <coughs> Excuse me. This little blip over here, we can treat this as uh, the same. We're going to have our peak occur on its point of impact. Now, this isn't a very large transition, so we don't need it to be an exceptionally strong peak on either side. But we're just going to create a little bit of a bow tie peak there. And if I play that back, that's looking pretty good. All right, so that is our scaling now done. Hopefully not as um, terrifying as you found it the first time with the ball bounce animation. Now what we're going to do is we are going to add some rotation to our character. 
to upsell the idea that it's actually orientating itself along the path which it moves. What we're going to be using for that is the rotation values for layer one and two. So I'm going to lock layer three by clicking on this little empty lock icon here. And when the lock icon appears, it means that I can't accidentally interact with that. I can't move my keyframes anywhere. It's just there as a visual guide now. I'm going to unlock layer two by clicking on the little lock icon. I'll select it and I'm going to hit R to bring up the rotation value. Now for our controller, I want to continue to use the position keyframes as a guide for where to place the rest of my frames. So rather than just hitting R, which would swap out the position for the rotation value, instead, I'm going to hold down Shift and hit R. Remember that holding down Shift and then hitting one of those traps shortcut keys adds or removes that value to the list visible in our timeline. So by holding Shift R, it's brought up rotation. I'm going to click on the little stopwatch to create my first rotation keyframe for layer one and the stopwatch to create rotation keyframe for layer two. All right, now in this exercise, we're quite lucky. The rotation values for these two will stay the same throughout. So that makes it quite easy to work with them. Our very first two rotation keyframes currently read zero x plus zero comma zero. Just to give you an idea, this first zero is a full rotation. All right, so if I adjust that number left or right, you're not gonna see anything happening on screen, but what you're essentially telling After Effects is that it needs to do a full 360 degree rotation. The next set of values is actually your degree value, and these are the ones that we're going to be working with. Okay, so please make sure not to make the mistake of editing the first zero for these two values. We want to be working with the plus zero comma zero degree value. Okay, so these are set to zero degrees. I'm gonna move myself out here to where we align with our very first position. And I think what we can do is, let's have our character actually, yeah, in line with our second position and our second scale frame, we're just gonna add a rotation value of about 15, I think, to both of these. Okay, so essentially as he's pulling back, he then rotates himself to build up that energy. Okay, as our character bends down to sort of build up that energy, we're not gonna have any change occurring in our rotation here. So I'm gonna copy and paste these keyframes just to duplicate them. And that's gonna tell After Effects not to change anything between them while we have this gap. We're gonna add some secondary action during this small space with our tail to better sell the idea of our ball bouncing. Okay, so my first set of keyframes reads zero degrees and zero degrees. My second set of keyframes reads positive 15, positive 15. And my third set again reads positive 15, positive 15. Okay, as my ball sails into the air, we are going to rotate our ball anti-clockwise. So we can maybe type in a value of negative 30 degrees and negative 30 degrees which allows our ball to reorientate itself as it bounces upwards. On its way down, if I align myself with my fifth position keyframe, I'm just going to invert these values. So rather than being negative 30, negative 30, I'll make that plus 30. You don't have to type in the plus, you just type in 30 and it will automatically assume that you mean the positive value. Okay. Moving on to the next time our ball is in mid-air, we want these to be in negative value ranges again. So I'm gonna make that negative 15 and negative 15. And we have decreased the intensity of that rotation because our character is not moving as far or as intensely. All right, so it wouldn't make sense if it's kind of yo-yoing back and forth across the screen. So as we now move, let's say align ourselves with the final position keyframe, I'm gonna make that positive 10 and positive 10. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna count out five frames, one, two, three, four, five, and I'm gonna type in a value of, let's make it negative eight, negative eight. Five frames later, one, two, three, four, five. We can make that a positive value of three and three. And then one, two, three, four, five, I'll finally bring it to rest at zero and zero degrees. 
Now, it's important that we add this little wag at the end because that's what helps to sell the idea that our character is actually dissipating the energy left from the action. So it's kind of wobbling, essentially. Okay. Playing that back, let's take a look. It's starting to come together. If I read through those values again for rotation, just so we're not lost, my first set of rotation frames for both layer 1 and 2 read 0 degrees. My second set both read positive 15 degrees. My third set both read positive 15 degrees. My fourth set, where my ball is at the top of its bounce, reads negative 30, negative 30. My fifth set, where my ball comes into contact with the ground, reads positive 30, positive 30. My next set, which is my ball at the top of its tiny bounce, that reads negative 15, negative 15. In line with my final position keyframe, my value as the ball hits the ground here is positive 10, positive 10. And then I have frames that will go to negative 8, negative 3, oh sorry, positive 3, and finally 0. Okay, and it's very important that I make sure that those values do decrease as we go. I can retime this a little bit even, seeing as those little rotations are taking longer or less rotation is occurring for these little blips. So if I align myself with my final position frame, I counted out five, one, two, three, four, five. That brought us to negative eight, negative eight. Then what I'll do is instead of having five frames, I'll just have four. So one, two, three, four. Just shift these frames up and then one, two, three and I can shift these final frames up. So by retiming these little wiggles at the end, I'm also selling the idea of our character dissipating that energy and coming back to rest. Okay, fantastic. What we're going to do next is make sure to select both the rotation for layer one and layer two, just by clicking and dragging. And once they're blue, we are going to apply easing. Now, as I said, we're quite lucky in this sense because for this exercise we could use the exact same values for each, which means that as long as I have one keyframe from layer one and one keyframe from layer two selected and I go into the graph editor, I'm essentially going to be editing the same graph, right? Because their values haven't been changing. So I can actually affect this graph for both of these values at the same time and make my life a little bit easier. Now to give you an idea, if you simply click on one of these keyframes and shift it, you'll see that I'm only adjusting one of those values at a time. So if I'm working with multiple keyframes inside of the graph editor, I need to click and drag to essentially tell After Effects to select both of the value keyframes that are sitting there. All right, so essentially the keyframe for layer one and the keyframe for layer two. So having clicked and dragged my second set of keyframes, I'm just gonna drag that handle to the left and that is going to follow the same motion that we have set up so far. All right. Now you'll notice for our rotation that our graph now goes into the negative value as well as the positive value. Now we don't need to get confused as long as we remember that anything that's closest to this black zero horizon line will be slow. We then remember that any peaks away from that black line, regardless of positive, uh, negative or positive value, will be fastest. The only reason why it's going into the negative value here is because our ball is rotating both clockwise and anti-clockwise. So this is just the way that the graph interprets that information. Okay. I'm going to align myself with where my ball is in midair. I'll drag and select both of those keyframes. And I'm going to push these handles away from that key, which means that my tail flip or that swish that's going to occur, we can even make quite a sharp peak over here and here. And this ensures that my tail changes nice and swiftly at the beginning and then at the end of our animation there. All right. In order to continue, I'm just gonna zoom in over here. We're going to now align with where my ball hits the ground. I'm gonna continue that peak that we have going on like so, and that is just going to ensure that we continue with that sort of force of motion that we've been putting into place. For these last little wiggles at the end, so essentially for the last four sets of keyframes here, we don't have a defining force involved. So we don't need this to have any particular peaks or troughs. 
we can just select these keyframes and we're going to adjust it slightly and create little mountains on our graph here so we can practice working with the graph and so that our actions take a little bit of time to speed up and slow down. And I'll do something similar like that there. So your graph should look something like mine. Boom. Yeah, that's looking okay so far. Okay. Great. We're almost done with this piece of animation. It's coming together quite nicely. The last thing that we need at the moment is we need to bring in a little bit of adjustment to this tail. We actually want this tail to swish as opposed to just being a dead piece of wood that sticks out the ass end of our character. So at the very beginning of my timeline here, I'm going to lock layer one and make sure that layer three has remained locked. And for layer two, I'm going to come next to this little block of color, which is a labeling function that we'll explore later in the year. There's a little arrow. Clicking on that arrow will collapse the entire layer. And clicking on it again will bring out all of our different properties here. Now I want to go to this little effect and click on the arrow next to it. And you'll see that I've already applied something called CC Bend It to our layer. Click this little drop down over here and we've got a bunch of different values. Now I've already set it up correctly. You don't need to touch anything here. The only thing that you need to do is just click on the little stopwatch next to the word bend. And that will create a keyframe for you. All right, so I clicked on the stopwatch for the word bend. Now, I don't want to animate with all of this dead space on screen. Right? This is a lot of real estate that's taking up that's quite unnecessary. So what I'm going to do is with my layer selected, I'm going to hit U for uniform on the keyboard. And what that is going to do is hide all of the different properties that do not have a keyframe on it. So essentially any property that hasn't had its um, stopwatch turned blue is going to disappear. And any property that does have a blue stopwatch that does have a keyframe will be revealed for you. Okay, so another useful feature if I just quickly unlock layer one. If I collapsed that and I wanted to bring up my values quite easily, I would simply hit U and it would then reveal the position and rotation for me. Okay, now the cool thing about this CC Bendit is if we take a look at the value for it, currently it reads 0, 0, but if you click and drag to the right, it is going to sort of curve your tail upwards and dragging it to the left will curve your tail downwards. All right, you can see that it, it can go too far. We can uh, clip the tail essentially, and that's because After Effects is struggling to read the information beyond a certain point. So as long as we don't push our tail too far, we'll have a nice little waggy tail going on. Okay, so I'm gonna reset that value to zero. And as my character slides to the left and starts building up that energy, I am going to draw the tail up over its head like so. So perhaps a value of about 80, maybe 90 will work for this example. Okay. Then we can copy and paste that keyframe. So we're in line with our third position keyframe right now. I'm gonna copy and paste my second bend frame because again, in this space, this is a hold. We've allotted our time here for the, <coughs> um, the scaling of the body. And it seems a bit of a waste now actually to not have our tail move in this space. So what I'm gonna do is I'm quickly gonna go back and align myself with my second bend keyframe here. And I'm just going to adjust the value to perhaps 70. So it'll read 0, 70, and then 90. It's just so we have like a little bit of change occurring over there. All right. Now, the rule of thumb is whenever our ball is sailing into the air, so right now where our ball is at the top of its peak, we will rotate our tail down. Whenever our ball is coming down, we will rotate our tail up. Okay, so to give you an idea what these keyframes do, my very first bend keyframe reads 0, 0. My second keyframe here will read 70. My third keyframe will read 90. Once my ball is at the top of its jump in midair, my bend value reads negative 50. In line with where my ball hits the ground for the first time, it reads positive 67. I'm just gonna round that down to 75. 
when the ball is at the top of its next little jump, our tail needs to swish down, but it's obviously not going to swish into like the 100 values, right? Because we don't have enough force for that to occur. So I'm just going to have a little swish, maybe negative 35 should work there. The next time the ball hits the ground, we'll just make that positive 25. Uh, maybe we can make that 35, have a little bit of flare on the end. And then in line with these little rotation keys that we have now created, I am going to as well, just go and swish my tail back and forth through the positive and negative values until it eventually comes to rest at zero. All right, so essentially I've just aligned myself on top of each of these rotation keyframes on layer two. Every time my ball moves upwards, my tail moves down. Every time my ball moves down, my tail swishes up. And then we have this little wiggle at the end to help sell the idea of our character coming to rest. Okay. One last set of easing to do. So I'm going to select the keyframes for bend and I'm going to apply easing to those. Dive into the graph editor here. And let's take a look at how we can adjust this motion. Aligning myself with my second keyframe, we know that we've been pushing this handle all the way to the left up until now. And that will have my tail take place at the same speed. As my ball squashes, we did the same thing here. So I'm going to grab my third keyframe and just push the handle to the left like so. And that just means that as my body squashes, my tail will react with that squash. Okay. Now I'm going to align myself with the keyframe that has my ball in mid air. And we're going to do the same thing that we did with our scales as well as for the rotation. We're gonna push these handles in either direction and we're going to make sure that that tail swish that occurs, occurs very quickly. So we've got a peak here that has our tail swish down quite violently. Swish, almost selling the idea that it's helping with the jump. And then our ball is, or our graph rather, is telling us that our tail is only going to start trailing behind the ball as it starts picking up, <coughs> excuse me, terminal speed. Where it hits the ground over here, we can make another peak. We can push that in the opposite direction there. And then for these final little keys here, just give me one second. All right, uh, for these last little frames here at the end, the same that we did for the rotation, we're not gonna make a dedicated peak or a dedicated trough. We're just going to adjust the graph editor ever so slightly to practice some subtlety and to add a little bit of our own sort of esoteric movement to that wiggle at the end. All right, and that is pretty much it now for the motion. Our character is essentially finished at this stage. However, drawing attention to our concept of overlapping action and follow through, at the moment, everything is happening at the same rate. And we can tell because our keyframes are all aligned on top of each other. So the final cherry on the cake that we're going to do before I then bring in some audio and then render is, sure, I'm out of breath, sorry, I ran upstairs, cigarettes. Um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be offsetting these keyframes slightly. So I am going to unlock layer one. We're not going to adjust anything on layer three. And I'm going to click and drag and make sure that I can uh, select rather the keyframes for rotation for layer one as well as for bend and rotation for layer two. And I'm simply going to shift them to the right by one frame. Then I'm just going to reselect only the keys for um, layer two and shift them up by one frame. And that slight little lag that we have now applied sells the idea that our character's tail is attached to the body rather than being, say for example, driven by an armature or a rig or something like that. Okay, cool. So that is the bare bones. That's all you need to do for the assignment. The next section now where I jump in with audio is simply for extra credit. Um, and then, oh yes, sorry, I've almost forgotten. Before I let you go, before I start bringing in audio and doing anything extra, I want you guys to please quickly click on this little blue button over here. And when you do, you'll see that magically two new layers will appear in your timeline. 
Now, I'll explain this feature to you guys in our next term, but for now, suffice to say that clicking that button will hide and reveal those two layers. If I unlock those layers, the first layer is called Command or Control Shift plus Y Floor, and the other one is the same convention, but for the background. Okay, now a quick tip. If I unlock my floor layer, I can shift that up and down simply by using my arrow keys. And this is where I can now zoom in and just make sure that at the beginning and at the end of my animation, my ball is touching that floor. So I can raise it right up to about there. And that way I don't need to try and adjust my entire animation if my ball was floating off of the floor ever so slightly. The next thing is in the name on the layer. If you hold down Command or Control Shift and Y, it will open up that layer's settings. Now this is a solid layer. We'll be taking a look at solids next term, but I want to point out that you have access to its color over here. And clicking over here will then allow you to adjust the color of your floor. So I'm going to set that maybe to this color blue. And then for my background, Command or Control Shift Y and I can set this to whatever I like here as well. All right, so this just gives you guys the opportunity to add a little bit of your own taste in color, change up the background a little bit so that you're not just stuck with a ball in an orange space. Once you're done, you can lock those two layers, click on that little button again, and we'll be good to go. Cool, now let's add some audio. All right, we're gonna add some sound and I'll make sure that the project file that I provide for you guys along with this assignment has got our two audio files for us. The first one is the bouncing sound that we used for our ball bounce animation. And then I've just quickly ripped a quick swish sound that we can add to our tail. Now, the best way to plan out where we want to place our audio is to simply see where the ball hits the ground. So I'm gonna select layer one and hit P for position. And this gives me an idea of where we need to add our noises. Now, it makes sense that we would add our noise when we hit the ground, both at the beginning and the end. So, we won't have any short sound here to begin with. In line with where our ball hits the ground, I'm going to grab the bounce sound from my project panel, and I'm just gonna click and drag it down here into my timeline. And I'm gonna shift it up so that it overlaps with this key over here. Now, you may either need to have it start immediately with that key or sit essentially one frame to the left and that will just make sure that the audio doesn't occur too soon. Now I know that you guys can't hear that in the recording but right now the bounce is sounding pretty good. Okay. Then I obviously wanted to hit the ground and make a small sort of sound here at the end. So what I'm going to do is with my bounce sound selected in my timeline, I'm just gonna duplicate that by hitting Control or Command D for duplicate. And I'll shift it out here as well, like so. Now, if I really wanna take these things to the next level, I'll play around with their audio a little bit. The very first bounce will be quite loud. The second bounce would be a little bit softer. So I'm going to go to where my second bounce is, and I'm going to toggle down the layer with this little arrow over here. I'm gonna to toggle down the audio option and I'm just gonna type in here minus 12. And that will decrease the sound by 12 decibels, just making it sound a little bit softer. Okay. For the swish, we only really need the swish as our ball leaves the ground here. So as he flies into the air, that's where the swish is going to occur. And I'm going to look for where the major change occurs in my tail. So that's kind of this section here kind of align myself here. So if yours was exactly the same, we're gonna count one, two, three, perhaps five frames to the right from my third position keyframe. What I can then do is just click and drag my video playback. That is our swishing sound. And I'm just going to align it over there. And then we have a little swish taking place here at the end. So I'm gonna do the same thing where I duplicate this layer. Control or Command D. I'll shift it up and I'm gonna to toggle it down and I'll also subtract 12 decibels from it just so that the swish is a little bit softer at the end. That switch is occurring a little bit too soon. So I'm just gonna shift that up to there, I think. 
Yeah, roughly there. Okay. And that's all we really need for the audio. We don't really need to add much else. Don't even need to add audio, to be honest. But it kind of just does add something to it. And um, it's a nice, well-rounded piece then at the end. Okay. Cool. Cool. Next, I am going to render this out. So we remember in our previous video that we need Adobe Media Encoder in order to render correctly uh, for motion design. So I'm going to wait for that to open up and then we'll dive into the rendering step. All right, so Media Encoder has now opened. That's this little window over here. And what I'm going to do is inside of After Effects, I'm going to go to File, Export, and Add to Adobe Media Encoder Q. All right, so that was File, Export, Add to Adobe Media Encoder Q. Once clicking on that, we wait in order for After Effects to talk to um, Media Encoder. It can sometimes take quite a while for it to make that link, but it will eventually drop our um, animation in here for us. Okay, now we want to make sure that it is set to H.264. We're going to make sure that it is set to match source high bitrate. And then we're going to click on the blue text here, which determines where this is rendered to. So I'll just render this to my desktop. And I'm going to call this ball and tail underscore student number. Say save, and then all we need to do is click on the little green arrow and let it render out for us, and we'll be finished. Okay, so I hope that that was simple enough to understand and enjoy. If you guys get stuck, please do let me know. Otherwise, I'll uh, check you in the next lesson. Good luck for the rest of the week. Ciao.